Well, that was an absolute catastrophe. June 22nd, 2018 marked the end of the annual rite of passage of the Leaving Certificate examinations, and the Junior Cert. But honestly, who gives a shit? This two-week period has become an Irish media extravaganza over the years, with social media feeds and even the nation's flagship news programme being dominated by examination-based discussions, from national coverage of the poets that made an appearance in English Paper 2, to politicians and influencers posting the same old clichés about the significance of the exams, while repetitively criticising the evident flaws in the education system. 2018 was absolutely no exception, as the SEC provided us with contentious papers that were met with dismay from over 50,000 sixth year students for a diverse range of reasons. As is tradition, the dreaded exam season kicked off with English Paper 1, which was a divisive paper this year to say the least. The theme of the paper was young writers, which I honestly found quite interesting. However, the controversy surrounding this particular exam derived from a questionable comprehension which required candidates to incessantly use a certain uncomfortable word and a few devious questions which were clearly intended to punish those who had planned on leaving Pepper 2 preparation to the last minute. Arguably the most prominent issue with this paper was that there was an evident generational conflict regarding the context of the word daddy. Of course, the 60-year-old men working at the SEC perceived the word daddy as a rather innocuous term which is used to affectionately refer to your biological father. On the other hand, for us Generation Z delinquents, the word Daddy has a radically different meaning, which I feel does not require an explanation. A plethora of distraught students expressed their frustrations on Twitter following the exam, and rightly so. It is pretty bizarre that after months of stressing over these exams and counting down the days until June 6th, that we began this marathon of high-stakes examinations by being subjected to discussing the character of Daddy and using this term in almost every line while trying to ignore the cringe. At this point, you may be thinking, what a trivial issue! So what, you had to write the word Daddy about 20 times in the opening page of your first college matriculation exam? Who cares? Well, the general consensus concerning the difficulty of this exam was also heavily impacted by another factor. This factor being the snaky decision to design the comprehension questions in a way that essentially forced every candidate to answer a mini Paper 2 question in Paper 1. This is why people drop out. Shockwaves were sent around thousands of exam centres, as questions based on study texts which rightfully belong on Paper 2, the studied text paper, decided to infiltrate the paper which has developed a fond reputation among students for being an exam that you can't study for. Clearly, those sadistic state examination commission maniacs hiding in their headquarters in Athlone like a bunch of cowards have some kind of vendetta against 6th year students, so they came up with the idea of basking in our misery by organising a special crossover paper as the inaugural 2018 Leaving Cert exam. Despite the fact that I actually studied my Paper 2 content beforehand, and I enjoyed answering this question due to my profound love for the character of Garrosh and Les Miserables. This was uncalled for. Quite a few students suggested bringing math sets and log tables into the exam centre for English Paper 2 as a response to the unscrupulous trickery executed by the SEC, which I initially scoffed at. But after contemplating this issue for quite a while, I decided to show up to Paper 2 fully prepared, just for good measure. The crown jewel of Leaving Cert English featured a pretty respectable selection of written compositions to choose from. There was nothing too out of the ordinary, like the 2017 roleplay which asked candidates who imagined that they had just invented the wheel in the Stone Age. However, it was ludicrous that those SEC comedians anticipated that anxious 17-year-old students would somehow be able to conjure up a robust, fleshed-out piece of detective fiction within the hour that is usually designated for this section of the exam. Overall, I would give English Paper 1 about 7 daddies out of 10. It did have its issues, but I was personally euphoric when I saw the question B's on the paper. Candidates could choose between an open letter about unwanted advice, an article about reading a text and watching its film adaptation, and an opinion piece which allowed you to critique the second level education system. Speaking as probably the only person in the country who spent 6 months writing a 16,000 word script on this exact topic, there were no prizes for guessing which question B I chose. Unfortunately, my excitement was quickly quenched by Paper 2, which is now infamous for a convoluted cultural context question. 55,000 students across the country cheered and breathed sighs of relief in unison when they learned that the two hot favourite poets to show up in this year's prescribed poetry section, John Montague and Eileen E. Quilla, whatever, had not deserted them in their time of need. Of course, the SEC being the SEC, ensured that they reigned on the parades of Montague's most ardent temporary fans by prescribing a question that was superfluously wordy and specific. It's fair to say that the questions about places and cultural identity left a sour taste in a lot of students' mouths, but that didn't stop them from writing essays about the only poet that they had bothered to learn. I am a pretty fair object man, so I will give credit to the SEC where credit is due. The questions in the single text section were just bursting with variety. For example, if you studied Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, you were asked to discuss the simple statement, Emily Bronte's portrayal of love and marriage in her novel, Wuthering Heights, is entirely negative. Whereas, if you studied The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, you were treated with, Fitzgerald's portrayal of love and marriage in his novel, Great Gatsby, is entirely negative. Ah, but if you studied Americana, you are asked to discuss 
Aditi's portrayal of love and marriage in a novel Americanism. Uh, stay with me. If you're one of the two schools in the country that studied All My Sons by Arthur Miller, you are given the question, Miller's play All My Sons provides moments of riveting drama that offer us thought-provoking insights into the human condition, a question which really promotes critical thinking and engagement with the text. And if you studied King Lear, like a normal school, you were asked to discuss Shakespeare's play King Lear provides moments of riveting drama that offer thought-provoking insights. Ah, oh, forget it! I was willing to overlook the laziness of the SCC and the act of essentially copying and pasting questions for drastically different texts when I saw the cultural context that come up in the comparative section. Literary genre was a welcome appearance too, but let's face it, nobody did this question. I was confounded by the 70 mark cultural context question though. Okay, I must write about aspects of cultural context. Oh, sorry, an aspect of cultural context. Wait, no, aspects. <sighs> I was relieved to learn that I was not the only person who was confused by this question, due to the unclear phrasing and how it essentially forced me to abandon the usual structure of comparative answers that I've become accustomed to over the past two years. Honestly speaking, I think that even Gloucester should have been able to see that there was a clear error in this question. Luckily, the SEC does adjust the marking scheme accordingly when there is a universal difficulty with a certain question, so hopefully I didn't throw away 70 marks and bring my grade down to a H5. And how could I forget about the unseen poetry? Not only do we have to rapidly write three long essays about a variety of texts within three hours, but we are also expected to scribble down some drivel about a confusing swan poem before time runs out immediately thereafter, while our brains and hands are exhausted and almost broken. So the poem is about swans in a museum and time and transients or something? I honestly have no idea. I think I'd have a better chance of understanding Jaden Smith's tweets. I was thrilled to see that Philip Larkin, a cultural context question, and a character question in King Lear all came up in the paper. Despite this, I can only give English Paper 2 about 6 cultural context aspects out of 10. It seemed as if the SEC were trying to prank the students who were praying for Montague to come up, and I could talk about that cultural context question for days. Much to my surprise, I was actually more satisfied with Maths Paper 1, which took place the following day. Maths was always my Achilles heel when it came to my secondary school subjects, which simply never clicked with me. However, after falling short of passing the Maths exam in the mocks by just 3%, I decided to go to Maths Grinds in an effort to actually become competent at the subject. I was lucky enough to live very close to a superlative Maths Grinds teacher who happens to be the greatest human being to ever walk on the planet. I can safely conclude that she single-handedly saved me from failing Leaving Cert Maths and subsequently jeopardizing my prospects of attending third level education because two months ago I had the mathematical dexterity of a bag of carrots, but after enlisting some extra help, I defied the odds and actually performed pretty well in the big exams. After two months of going to grinds, studying hard and practicing questions around the clock, I walked out of both math exams with a huge smile on my face. As a matter of fact, I enjoyed paper one so much that I printed it out and I did it all again. I found it substantially easy, with the exception of a few difficult questions near the end which took me a while to figure out. Paper two was a similarly fair exam, which provided a few challenges that really separated the men from the boys. The questions in paper 1 seemed pretty radical for a past paper though, featuring earthquakes, tsunamis, and medicinal drugs in the bloodstream. In all fairness, it wasn't an outrageous exam by any means, unlike the higher level paper. The rather obscure topic, sequences and series, seemed to be the main focus of higher level maths paper 1, for unknown nonsensical reasons. The absence of financial maths and the prominence of sequences and series led to some controversy, but the paper was generally well received. As an ordinary level student who glanced at the higher level paper and stumbled across this repugnant abomination, I have absolutely no idea how anybody without a master's degree in mathematics would have been able to answer the questions in this terrifying exam. But it is nice to see that higher level students were satisfied with the exam after two years of intensely studying this demanding subject. Of course, I cannot rate the higher level paper because I was nowhere near intelligent enough to complete two years of studying honours maths, but the ordinary level papers get a 9 out of 10 from me. Personally, I am fortunate enough to have not studied senior cycle geography, but for those poor souls who sat the geography exam just a few hours before maths paper 1, nightmares about aerial photographs would probably be a frequent occurrence from now on. <sighs> the SEC just love to outdo themselves, don't they? The most memorable part of the geography exam was the section where candidates were expected to identify a church in a picture which featured a few hundred buildings. Students complained that this picture was like a game of Where's Wally, just without the fun, and with the added pressure of being part of a stressful exam which culminates two years of work for a subject that entails a ludicrous amount of rote learning and rapid regurgitation of essays, where time is of the essence so you can't afford to lose valuable minutes searching for a church in a picture in hopes of acquiring a few extra marks, which could easily be obtained elsewhere. 4 out of 10, shame on you SEC. One of the most baffling aspects of the exam season is the procedure that has to be followed whenever you wish to use the lavatory during an examination. I found it quite creepy when the so-called superintendent attendant followed me into the bathroom when I needed to go during Irish paper 2. And it became even more unsettling when he follows me into the cubicle as well, but that's a story I prefer not to get into.
In order to ensure the integrity of the examinations, the superintendent attendant, a fancy term for a person who sits outside an exam centre all day playing on a laptop or reading a book while fellow students are frantically completing terminal examinations and occasionally has to step away from their desk to give tea and biscuits to the examiner and nothing for the students and receives a couple hundred euro for doing so, has to follow you into the jacks in case you use it as an opportunity to cheat for an exam. I can see why this is done, but the whole concept is pretty creepy. And honestly, if you're desperate enough to hide chinos in the toilet, then I would seriously advise you to check yourself into the nearest psychiatric hospital. Sure, when the superintendent attendant follows me into the bathroom, it's just their job. But I'm given 10 hours of community service when I follow somebody into the bathroom. Anyways, ordinary level Irish was as simple as ever. While the high level students were forced to write lengthy essays about the health system and the environment and whatever, us ordinary level Neanderthals sat back and wrote the usual one or two pages about Hilkerms, Tibishtas and letters about holidays abroad. In spite of that, I was perplexed by the lack of difficulty in both papers. As was the case with every other exam, the answer booklet we received contains two checkboxes, where candidates are expected to indicate to the examiner whether they have decided to take the paper in English or Irish. At first, I couldn't believe that this option was available for the Irish papers, but I took an opportunity when I saw one, so I ticked the English box and I wrote to my heart's content to Berla. This might bring my grade down to an O2, but it shouldn't be anything too drastic. Despite this, I couldn't help but feel aggravated when I listened to Jacob speaking fluent Irish just seven years after receiving Irish residency in the listening comprehension. His unnatural Donegal accent made him sound more like a parody of a Donegal resident. Naturally, it became a tedious task trying to decipher what this man was saying, but thankfully, the simplicity of ordinary level questions carried me through this one. Paper 2 was nothing special. It featured the usual two reading comprehensions which are like extracts from a primary school activity book. Pick out a word from the question, locate that word in the comprehension, copy the sentence into your booklet, and Bob's your uncle. I was blessed that the exact two stories and two poems that I had my money on were featured in this paper. All in all, Irish gets a 10 out of 10 from me. I'll see you all in the Gweltops. Don't start thinking I'm some kind of Irish language enthusiast. The structure and content of Irish papers truly illustrates the obsolescence of how examinations are conducted in the Emerald Isle. One particular question from the Litter slash Refus section asks candidates to write a letter to their friend talking about their new phone and the things they can do. Number 1. What kind of person under the age of 65 still writes letters in 2018? Number 2. Why would a teenager who can download various messaging applications onto their new phone decide to write a letter to their friend instead of texting that friend from the new phone poker? Number 3. Why would a teenager tell another teenager about the features of a device that has been globally accessible, especially to teenagers, over the past decade? Surely in a generation where young people are routinely scrutinised for being notoriously addicted to smartphones, the ACC should have copped the fact that nobody our age writes letters, and we don't need to be told about what phones can do. Well, I guess it is to be expected from a group who only realised in 2018 that computer science should be introduced into the curriculum. Two subjects which proved to be astronomically more frustrating than this petty issue in the Irish paper were history and art history. I knew immediately when I turned to the European section in the history exam that I had a major problem on my hands. Where is Stalin? World War II leadership does not count because nobody studied this. Where are his economic policies? Where are the show trials? Nothing about his use of propaganda or terror? I don't have much to say right now except SEC, you are the primary cause of uncontrollable crying among Irish teenagers. I am considering leaping off of the cliffs of Mohair because my aspirations of achieving a H1 in history were demolished by the dictatorship and democracy section and I demand that you refund my mother's 116 euro you dastardly thieves and as for art history fuck this subject I noticed that a lot of students shared my frustrations regarding the history paper, so if you're interested in directly confronting the SEC, here are some directions to their headquarters. Thankfully, the good luck cards I received still came in handy, as my other two elective subjects, business and German, were infinitely nicer than this pair of traitors. It was strange how the German paper actually featured more EU content than the business paper, but both of these exams were well received nonetheless. The short questions in the business exam were significantly more difficult than in past years, but the ABQ and the long questions were reasonably challenging and manageable. German was personally one of my better exams this year. While the exam itself was fair and well made, I couldn't help but internally chuckle at the SEC's abysmal attempt at trying to sound like a young German pen pal. When I read sentences from the German letter such as, how can we reduce rubbish, give two suggestions, I just can't help but think about how it does not sound like an authentic letter from a German buddy at all. It just sounds like a typical, soulless SEC question masquerading as a friendly conversation starter from Julia or Julian, in a pathetic effort to add some heart and personality into an otherwise monotonous paper. It would be an understatement to say that this year's German listening comprehension was quite a dramatic one. It kicked off with a farcical story about an 11 year old boy who watched driving tutorials on YouTube, then decided to hijack his parents car, and he drove his 5 year old sister into town to go to a fast food joint. And if that wasn't enough, we then almost listened to a German couple breaking up, before an anticlimactic reconciliation where they agreed to go to a restaurant in the evening. I would really love to find out what creative genius writes the scripts for these comprehensions. 
Business and German both get an 8 out of 10 from me, which is 7 points more than what I'd give to history and art history combined, and multiplied by 100. The overall running of the examinations this year was an improvement from last year. Although the issue of examiner shortages still exists, which is extremely worrying by the way, the SEC did rectify an issue which came to fruition during the 2017 exams. In response to a fiasco where Irish Paper 1 was uploaded to a Facebook page for Irish teachers while the exam was still underway, the SEC decided to officially publish exam papers on the website as soon as the exam commences. I guess it is a welcome feature for sociopaths who enjoy sitting in the comfort of their own homes, reading the papers that are currently being completed by thousands of distressed students in sweltering exam halls. Furthermore, I believe that superintendents have become a lot more friendly since I completed my junior cert. While they are usually austere, overbearing freaks of nature, the superintendent who was supervising my exam centre was very pleasant and sociable. She wasn't just there to enforce rules, regulations and conformity. She made a real effort to interact with us, ensure that the temperatures weren't too intolerable, and to ask us how we found the exams and if we were looking forward to the holidays. This really doesn't sound like much, but I greatly appreciate little things like that, and it really enhances the whole examination experience by making it less stressful and uncomfortable. In conclusion, yeah, the leaving cert sucks, and I will never ever do it again under any circumstances. Most of the exams were okay, but the whole system undoubtedly inflicts an unhealthy amount of stress and pressure on young people. The SEC staff could greatly benefit from acquiring a few extra brain cells, but I do not think that is a very realistic expectation. However, my fellow graduates never have to worry about all that again. We survived through this hellish system together, and now it's time to enjoy the summer holidays and look forward to seeing what the future has in store for us. Well, that's all I have time for in this video. I have two hours of community service today. Hopefully I will see you all for my passionate video essays detailing my content for the education system. But until then, make sure to stay happy, stay safe, stay creative, and don't fail your leaving search or you'll end up like me. Well, the general consensus concerning the difficulty of this, of this exam is... <laughs> I have to die.